Hello again, everybody. This is Jack Stevenson, and thanks for joining me for segment four of my keynote presentation on my latest ebook titled Pursuing a Jacques Delcroix Education Solfege, Volume 1. In this segment, we will, as promised, finish up our discussion of Unit 1 with a short history of psalmization. But let's first look at what Monsieur Jacques has to say. The study of solfege awakens the sense of pitch and tone relations and the faculty of distinguishing tone qualities. It teaches the pupil to hear and to reproduce mentally melodies in all keys, single and simultaneous, and every kind of combination of harmony, to read and to improvise vocally, to write down and use the material for constructing music himself. So you see here, Jacques Delcroze is giving us a definition of what solfege is, and at the same time setting the goals of a Jacques Delcroze solfege course, or even a textbook. Certainly, this description is the basis upon which this textbook was built. So I hope this ebook will help all my students accomplish the goals set down by Monsieur Jacques. Now let's look first at what a psalmization is. It attribu attributes a distinct syllable to each pitch in a musical scale. So you see, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, la, sol, fa, mi, re, do. So instead of C, instead of C, D, E, F, G, A, B, so we have do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, la, sol, fa, mi, re, do, do, sharp. Now re, re, flat. So it's the same as using letter names, uh, but we substitute the letter names for the syllables. And uh, there's no real reason why you couldn't use the English letter names instead of the syllables. And it's an ancient practice. It began as early as 1300 to 1000 BC, and we think it began with in, in India. They, too, have a system of solemnization, uh, very similar to ours. And, uh, however, in the West, it finds its roots with the work of Guido. Now, Guido Arezzo, he's a pretty famous guy, an Italian Benedictine monk, worked for the church, obviously, music theorist, and probably one of the most highly regarded music pedagogues of the Middle Evo, um, uh, medieval era. era. He uh, was invited to visit the Pope, and uh, on his visit, he was instructed to teach the Pope a hymn using his system, and as a result, the Pope learned to read the hymn himself and sight sing it in a day. And so after that, Guido's name was golden, and so his work then spread throughout all of uh, the Roman uh, church. So you can see where he became sort of quickly well-known and regarded highly by his uh, colleagues and his students. And now, and the, the thing about his work is he developed the hexachord and the hexachord system. And this hexachord system, and you will see, really became the basis of Western music composition as we know it. Now, the hexachord system began first by devising the hexachord. So you have to know what a hexachord is first. A hexachord is a group of six contiguous pitches from the ancient text Ut Queront Laxis. Guido composed a melody that sequenced each phrase on a joining pitch one whole step or half step higher. Now, some historians contend that Guido didn't compose the music, but simply discovered it. Well, I kind of don't believe that because as an educator, I think he probably wrote a composition that would help his students learn to sing these uh, pitches and put syllables to them so that they could remember them, so they could meld the syllable with the sound. So the beginning symbol of each phrase is in red, as you can see. And it was those pitches, those letters, I'm sorry, those syllables were adopted as the names of the, uh, the notes within the hexachord, or the functions. So you have ut, re, mi, fa, sol, and la, right there. They go move up right, quite, right in the row. Quite ingenious, if you ask me. So um, we have, let me try to sing it for you. Do, re, fa, re, mi, re. Re, re, do, re, mi, 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 sol, mi, re, mi, do, re, fa, sol, la, sol, fa, re, re, sol, la, sol, mi, fa, sol, re, la, sol, la, fa, sol, la, la, sol, fa, re, do, mi, re. So it is a very beautiful melody, and uh, the text is quite lovely as well. Uh, if you would uh, uh, read the translation, it has here, so that your servants may, with loosened voices, surround the wonders of your deeds, clean the guilt from our stained lips, O St. John. So it's a hymn to St. John for his feast day. 
keep in mind every saint <clears throat> in the Roman church has a feast day, and there are many hymns and songs and uh, canticles written for various saints on their feast day, and they were sung on that day. So this is obviously one to St. John, one of many actually to St. John the Baptist. He was a pretty famous saint, so he had quite a few hymns written. So now the hexachord system is a series of three such hexachords. One begins on G, way down there at the bottom of the staff, and that's known as the hard hexachord. Another one begins on C, and it is known as the natural hexachord. You can see that's in red. The G is in uh, the G scale is in uh, blue, and there's a third one that begins on F, which is green, and is known as the soft or mole hexachord. The entire gamut began on line one of the grand staff down there at G, and that was known as the gamma ut, and ended on the top space, which is the la mi or the mi la. That the top space, which is uh, I guess it then runs from a, a bass, a sol or G, to a treble mi or E. Now, the three hexachords take their names from the use of B or B flat, uh, or no B at all. Uh, let's look at the scale beginning on G ut re sol. That's the, 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 the G below middle C. It's on the top staff. Uh, if you follow the scale ut re mi and look directly up from mi, you will see that the mi is using a B natural. So we have to go ut re mi and have a major third there, So, which uh, looked like an H more than a natural sign. So that H was known as the hard B. So that scale is the hard scale. Now look at the fa, I'm sorry, the uf, nah, the f ut fa, which is uh, the modern f below middle c, or base f. If you follow that scale, you will see that the fa, ut re mi fa, goes straight up for it, you know, from it. Now it uses the soft b, or what we call the b flat. So the soft b was the b that looked like a b flat, or a flat, or a b, and the hard b looked like an h. And now you know why Germans use the letter B for B flat and the letter H for B natural. Now, the natural scale, the red scale, has no B at all. So that's why it's called natural scale. So without any B whatsoever, that's the natural scale. And the two scales, one uses the hard B, one uses the soft B. So we only have one altered pitch in the entire gamut. Now notice the diagonal lines uh, ranging from soul to me, uh, and each soul moving up to uh, a higher me. Follow those lines. You have one, two, three, four of them. This was a, a device used to extend the scale beyond the original six pitches or to move from one scale to another. It's known as mutation. And mutation is really the ancestor of tonicization and modulation. Now, by linking the syllable soul me, the word solmization was created, and it was used to signify that we were going to move up to the next scale or move down to the previous scale so that we could either change keys that way or just extend the uh, range of our melody. Uh, now, in the book, I have examples of some of this, and I have them analyzed and written out for you to see. So it's quite interesting to see how the solmization works. Now, instead of using that staff, uh, as I have, Guido, in fact, used his hand. You can see that the gamma ut there is at his thumb knuckle, and if you follow down, you go to the A, Re, the B, Mi, the C, Fa, Ut, and C, Fa, Ut there. It's the only C, Fa, Ut on the whole gamut, and we know that C, Fa, Ut is base C, the C below middle C. So, and all of these pitches have their unique combinations. So, the hand signs, what we here do is point to the various knuckles, and the students would sing back those pitches and uh, quite inventive and uh, <laughs> quite complicated. I've seen it done. It's quite remarkable. You'll notice there's a little la, e la sticking up there at the top, and that syllable is on the back of the hand. You have to turn your hand around and point to the back of your hand, and that's where the e, the highest e is, I guess. Uh, we don't gonna use that one too much, so it's all right if it's on the other side of the hand. So quite an ingenious invention. And here is his tetragram. This he did invent. Even though we did use lines, uh, we used a red line first, and then we used a red and a yellow line next, he is the guy who came up with 
the four lines and placing the nooms on the lines and spaces and placing these clefs on the lines and spaces to identify them. The red line was probably always F. The C line had always probably been C. He's just reinforcing that by creating clefts that goes on them. And um, then eventually, you know, the colors gave way, and we only used black lines and maintained the clefts. So another uh, great invention. This is why the, the Pope was able to, uh, it was actually Pope John, I think, the 13th, who was able to actually learn to read using this tetragram. Now, uh, we find...